Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. For elections in Pakistan, which are scheduled for the 8th of February, we postponed because on Thursday, the Pakistan Senate passed a resolution calling for precisely that, a delay of the elections. But regardless of when the elections are held, are they likely to be free and fair? Or could the concerns raised by former Prime Minister Imran Khan in a recent article in the British magazine, The Economist, turn out to be valid and correct? Joining me to address both those questions, live from Lahore, is one of the country's best-known editors and clearly one of its most outspoken political commentators, the founder editor of the Friday Times and the former caretaker chief minister of Pakistan's Punjab province, Najam Sethi. Mr. Sethi, let me start by asking if elections will be held on time. Your election commission has announced that they are scheduled to be held on the 8th of February, but on Thursday, the Senate passed a resolution demanding that they be delayed for two reasons. Firstly, because of the prevailing security conditions, and secondly, because of the cold weather. So will elections be held in a month's time as they should be, or is the stage being set for a postponement? Um, hello, everyone. Karan, that's the multi-billion dollar question. Um, I think except for the establishment, no one really knows whether they will be held or they won't be held. The interesting thing is that most people think they won't be held. But equally, the government and establishment sources say, yes, they will be held. So that's the sort of current situation we are in. The country is awash with rumors of all sorts, uh, that uh, there will be a law and order situation that will lead to a cancellation or a postponement of the elections. Um, all manner of conspiracy theories that they perhaps an emergency may be declared, a financial emergency or some other form of emergency, and at the last minute they may be postponed. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that, first of all, they've already been delayed beyond the 90-day period that was uh, mentioned in the Constitution. But this has been sanctioned and approved by the Supreme Court. Now the courts are very, very clear in their own minds that they must be held on the 8th of next month. And so, therefore, we are now a month away from the elections, and there is no election activity going on in this country. Instead, the country, as I said, is awash with all manner of rumors and conspiracy theories. And now, why is that? I think the reason for that is that the perception, the public perception is that if there were to be absolutely free and fair elections, which would be quite unprecedented because there have rarely been free and fair elections in this country, except perhaps on a couple of occasions, um, then in that case, the Imran Khan's party would have a majority over the others. That's the public perception. That's also part of what the surveys are showing. Now, here's the problem again. If that were to happen, uh, there would be an acute uh, constitutional and other crisis because Imran Khan was thrown out by the establishment and the other parties who got together. And um, now if he were to come back, there would be a huge hiccup as far as the establishment's plans are concerned going forward. And also the rehabilitation of Nawaz Sharif and Asif Zadari and all the other politicians who were at the receiving end of the stick from Imran Khan, who were determined that he would wipe out all the political parties and have a single party rule in the country along with the help of the establishment. So we have this great dilemma when we have a, an army chief 
who was kicked out by Imran Khan when he was DGISI. And they're said to be some personal issues involved as well. And then there are all the other issues of uh, Imran Khan's competence to, to handle the job. So I'm afraid it's pretty murky out here. And um, we really won't know which way the wind is going to blow come 8th of uh, January. Let me quickly for the audience point out that the establishment you refer to is Pakistani language for the military, which is a controlling influence in your country and has been so for the last 75 years. Now, let's briefly discuss the reasons cited by independent Senator Dilawar Khan in his resolution calling for postponement of elections and ask you whether he is really raising credible reasons. First of all, he refers to, and I'm quoting him, serious threats to the lives of prominent politicians in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa as well as Baluchistan. And I gather, according to the Pakistan Institute for Conflict and Security Studies, there were over 600 attacks by armed groups in 2023, which is an increase of 60% over 2022. And the same organization says that 93% of these attacks took place in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Baluchistan. So in your estimation, is a lack of security a legitimate reason for postponing elections or is it just an excuse? Uh, let's first put the Senate resolution in perspective. There are over 100 members of the Senate, the upper house, of which only 14 were present. One, four were present that day when the resolution was carried, of which two uh, voted against. So now what is the importance of such a resolution that was clearly uh, came up right at the last minute as though it was a last minute attempt to do something. Uh, if you look at the situation in the House, there are not too many people to oppose it. So most people think that it has no more significance than purely an attempt by the establishment and its uh, supporters in the Senate to check the waters to see what the public reaction is going to be, to see what the international reaction is going to be for a, a, a resolution such as this. Because at the end of the day, Karan, this resolution carries no weight. Uh, even if it had been a resolution by all the, all the members of the Senate, it would still not have been binding in any way. So therefore, I think we shouldn't pay too much attention to that. But this is the point I'm making. My sense is that the elections will be held on time, provided as we go up towards the run-up to the elections, the establishment feels comfortable with its control over the results that are going to come. Uh, if the establishment thinks they will not be able to manage the sort of numbers game that they are playing, in other words, coalition governments at the center, Imran Khan in a minority, and so on and so forth, no threat from Imran Khan, and a workable arrangement of a hybrid regime, monitored and, shall we say, controlled by the establishment with prime ministers and presidents and all the rest of it, but which could then last for the next five years. If the establishment thinks they can manage this situation, then they will go, go ahead and hold the elections. But if they think they can't manage it, and there may be some serious issues uh, in terms of uh, the election results, if they allow a greater freedom to it, then I'm afraid uh, they will have to think again. Uh, my sense is that uh, uh, there is no question of Imran Khan, Imran Khan coming back, uh, being released, or being acquitted. I think those decisions have already been taken, and some of the cases are pretty strong against him, even though he has a lot of sympathy uh, and support, even in the judiciary. Um, and so, therefore, I think we're on track, provided something doesn't happen. Now, we say... There's talk about a law and order situation, what you've just mentioned. It's absolutely true that uh, the peripheral areas of Pakistan are experiencing daily attacks by people from across the border uh, in Afghanistan, whether they are Baloch insurgents or whether they are TTP uh, or whether they are IS. So all three are now involved in uh, attacking the Pakistani state uh, from along the borders. What if these attacks were to spill over into the urban areas? What would happen then? That's an open question. Under those circumstances, how will you have uh, a, a free run of elections if people will be scared to come out to vote or, or if polling booths are attacked? Or even if I may say so, if any of those organizations issues a formal statement that can be attributed to it, that can confirm it, that say that we are against democracy, we will not allow these elections to take place. What then? 
at least two of those organizations have openly said that they are against this whole notion of elections and democracy and so on and so forth. So, you know, we are facing a pretty uncertain situation right now. But you don't think that as things stand, the security situation is serious enough to postpone elections. That postponement will only happen if the establishment loses confidence in the results. If it's uncertain of the outcome, it will find any excuse to postpone the elections. But if it's confident it can get the result at once, then regardless of the security threats, elections will happen. It all hinges upon that confidence. Can we get the outcome we want? Now, here's the interesting uh, point to make. Whenever the establishment has connived with the opposition to throw out a sitting prime minister or a sitting government, the populace, the voter has perceived it as a way to now vote for the other side. People don't want to waste their votes. If they think the establishment is against a particular leader or against a political party, they've always voted for the other party to come into office because they think the establishment is completely totally powerful and can do whatever they want. So there's no point in wasting the vote. The perception right now is that there is no way that Imran Khan can be allowed to win. Even if there is a considerable body of support for the People's Party and for the Muslim League Noon, Nawaz Sharif's party, it's not as though they have no support. The People's Party is still the largest party in Sindh province. And Nawaz Sharif will give a run to Imran Khan for his money in Punjab. KP is predominantly, KP means Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, is predominantly um, uh, Imran Khan uh, and some votes for the religious parties. And as far as Balochistan is concerned, Balochistan will elect tribal leaders who will obey the command of the establishment, which way they will go, who will they will join or not. So at the end of the day, there will be a coalition government. Um, my sense is that uh, in a free and fair fight, even then, Imran Khan would have difficulty in putting together an overwhelming majority to be able to run a government. He couldn't do this in 2018 when the establishment helped him to come to power. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We are now all agreed here in Pakistan that that election was heavily rigged in order to facilitate Imran's uh, accession to power. And I think if, if you go by the standards of that election, my sense is the same sort of thing is going to happen this time to make sure that Imran doesn't come back. What about the second explanation given by Senator Dilawar Khan when he moved that resolution seeking the postponement of elections? He cited the weather. Now, elections in 1985, in 1997, in 2008 were all held in February. We're still 22 days away from February. Is there any reason to believe that February 2024 will be considerably colder than February was in those earlier three years? Or is this... A pretty hard to accept reason for postponing elections. You know, this issue has been raised by some of the parties who have votes in the northern areas, where the, a large swath of territory is likely to be under snow, and road roads are going to be difficult to access, and so on and so forth. But as you say, this is nothing new. We've been we've had elections in the past and during these times of the year. This is a pretty lame excuse. It's as lame as excuses as is that resolution in which 12 people asked for a postponement of the elections. Do you have any sense of where General Asim Munir, your army chief, stands on this issue? A lot depends upon his confidence in the outcome of the elections. And if he feels he'll get the result he wants, and clearly the one result he does not want, is Imran Khan coming back to power, which you explained in one of your earlier answers. But do you have any sense of where he stands on this issue? Has he got the confidence at the moment that he's displaying we can go ahead with it? Or do you think that when he went to America just a couple of weeks ago, he may even have discussed with the Biden administration the possibility of postponing elections to ensure that Imran does not come back? The thing is that the Americans have not interfered in Pakistan's political system in any direct way ever uh, in the recent past. Imran Khan's allegation is that they had a role to play in uh, uh, maneuvering his ouster. That's not absolutely true. It is true they don't, didn't like Imran Khan in many of his statements, but that's not true. Imran Khan was his own worst enemy, and he created the conditions that led to his own ouster. So let's put that bogey aside. Going forward, I think General uh, Asim Munir probably never discussed these issues with the Americans because their official position always has been and will remain that they would like to see free and fair elections. 
Uh, and so they're not going to change that perspective. Going forward, I think uh, General Asim Munir is very strong. He's a clear-headed general. He has very uh, firm views about a lot of things. And he's a very strong believer. Uh, so my sense is that whatever decisions he takes, he will stick to them and carry them through, even if that means ruthlessly so. When you say he's a very strong believer, are you saying that there is a moral underpinning to his thinking because of his personal commitment to his faith, Islam, and therefore he would feel a need to go ahead with the elections for that reason, if not other? Mike, I don't think Islam has anything to do with these, Islam, uh, with these elections. This is real politic. Uh, all army generals have been very realistic about such issues. If you remember, you couldn't have become a bigger Islamist than General Zia. And you know the sort of political somersaults he took and the double crossing he did. So I don't think uh, that comes into the equation. But it, it does uh, come into Asim Munir's equation because he's, uh, when he, should he take some steps to do whatever he wants to do, he will carry through with them. He will not be dissuaded by other issues. As I said, he's a believer and uh, believers have a strong faith in some of the actions they take. Uh, and they think they are rightly guided. So I think uh, we have to wait and see and how this pans out. In principle, I think there will be elections. I think Imran will uh, be not able to secure any majority. I think they'll be able to manage these elections. But having said that, if at any stage the people of Pakistan decide that they are going to come out in their hordes, in their thousands and tens of thousands, and resist any manipulation that may be about to take place, then the situation could change. Whether that will happen or not, I can't say. My sense is it won't happen. Let's then come, Mr. Seji, to the second big question I want to discuss with you. The question, how fair, how free will the elections be? In a piece that appeared under his name, although I know there is a certain controversy in your country whether Imran Khan actually wrote it, but the piece was published by The Economist just a couple of days ago, Imran Khan has said that the elections would be, and I'm quoting him, a disaster and a fuss. And his argument is, and again I'm quoting him, the establishment, which he explains is the army, security agencies, and the civil bureaucracy is prepared to provide, sorry, let me read that again, is not prepared to provide any playing field at all, let alone a level one for PTI, which is his party. Clearly, your answers suggest he's correct when he says that. Well, you know, the thing is, Imran Khan has forgotten what happened in 2018. So, you know, the boot, boot is on the other foot now. The fact is, there are some issues involved with this article of his. The first is that, did he write this article or was it written for him and, and published under his name? Uh, the jail manual clears clearly that a convict cannot write, communicate with anyone, especially in writing, without it being vetted by the superintendent of jail. My sense is that Imran has neither said that he wrote the article nor that he didn't. And I think that there will be a new case instituted against him. Because if he doesn't deny writing the article, then they will say that you violated the jail rules, you wrote something, you smuggled it out, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't know what his position is likely to be. Uh, having said that, there are lots of inaccuracies in this article. It's, a, it's full of inaccuracies and falsehoods, but there are truths in it too. Uh, and so therefore, uh, some of the claims he makes about his own performance and the conspiracy theories he attributes to his ouster are all nonsense. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the fact that he thinks that there is, a, the, there is no level playing field that is correct. There is no level playing field against him. Just as there was no level field, uh, 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 just as there was no level field for Nawaz Sharif in 2018, when Imran Khan was the beneficiary of that lopsided uh, scoring field. So I'm afraid, you know, we in Pakistan have become pretty cynical about some of these issues. Um, and Imran Khan's holier than thou attitude uh, appeals to uh, his supporters. But if you have to be fair and, uh, and, and independent and make an independent assessment, uh, the fact is that uh, he is reaping what he has sown himself. Let me quote Al Jazeera. This is Al Jazeera from the 5th of this month. It says, not only have Imran Khan and now his uh, for former foreign minister's papers been rejected by the election commission, but Al Jazeera says, and I'm quoting, the papers of thousands of other opposition candidates were also rejected by the commission. But I believe yesterday... 
the election commission informed your supreme court that pretty close to 87 88% of pti candidates have been cleared so what is the position is al jazeera right or is al jazeera already a day old al jazeera is already a day old the fact is yes uh, a lot of people from the PTI file their nomination papers. Normally, what happens is that one person files a paper and there is a second as a candidate, what you call a covering candidate for him. So each party doesn't file more than two or three uh, papers uh, candidates. In the PTI's case, since there was some doubt about whether or not they would be allowed to fight under the PTI symbol, uh, because that's also a question mark right now, whether they will get a particular symbol to represent the full party or not, or whether there will be some more confusion on that score. PTI fielded a number of candidates, unofficially PTI, uh, but officially uh, independents. And so therefore, uh, some of them were just fly-by-night operators uh, who were just told to file and just to keep the pressure on. So I don't think there's any significant person in the PTI has been disqualified. Uh, I think this the qualification process has been uh, genuinely fair. There is not much to write home about. Yes, there was a lot of harassment. Yes, the agencies uh, tried to create difficulties in the way of uh, candidates, those who were trying to, uh, who were known to be PTI supporters. They were, uh, they were advised not to, uh, and so on. Some agreed, some didn't. Some went ahead and did it. Uh, so on the whole, um, uh, PTI nominations have been accepted. Now, you raise this issue about the party symbol, which is the bat. And the bat clearly is not just a symbol for the party. It's a symbol for Imran Khan himself because it represents cricket. And it is, I presume, an extremely popular symbol in Pakistan for that reason alone. Yours is, like ours, a cricket-mad country. But will that, in fact, be ultimately denied to him? I believe that case is now likely to go to the courts. What's your sense? Will it be denied? And if it's denied to his party... How will that denial be perceived by the voters? Well, if it's denied, then the voter will see this as yet another attempt to rig the elections against Imran. Uh, the, the pro there are legal problems here. The Election Commission has denied that symbol to the PTI because it says the PTI didn't carry out internal elections. Uh, so it has a valid reason. That's why they were denied that. Now, if that if they denied the, the symbol, then there's no PTI then all PTI candidates must either band together into a new party, which is going to be difficult because then it has to go through the whole process again. There's not enough time for that. Or all of them will stand as independents. And they will stand as independents and people will be expected to know that this independent candidate is a candidate who's actually a PTI candidate. That will be to the disadvantage of the PTI. And I think that behind this thinking of not of denying them this, uh, this symbol, is this sort of thinking that that will make life even more difficult for the PTI to get its act together. Now, you suggested in an earlier answer, Mr. Sethi, that the perception, and I underline that word, the perception in Pakistan is that if free and fair elections are held, Imran Khan and his party is likely to win. In his Economist article, he claims that something called the Patton Coalition 38 poll in December suggested that 66% of the country supports him, supports his PTI. Do you agree with that 66% figure? That is a two-thirds vote in his favor. Because if you do agree with it, it would suggest that if that's the outcome, he's going to sweep the results. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's not correct. You know, if you just read it in a statistical sense, it doesn't make sense. For example, polls in KP show that figure to be probably correct. In Punjab, the polls don't show that. In Sindh, the polls don't show that. Uh, so in Punjab, maybe Imran may have a 10% lead. In KP, he would have a 20 to 30% lead. In Sindh, I don't think he would have a lead at all. Uh, and in Balochistan, as I said, it's everybody's game and nobody's game uh, and so on. So I don't think that that uh, sort of uh, poll uh, suggests anything more concrete. Let me ask you something else about Imran Khan. He says in his Economist article that he faces up to 200 legal cases. He's been in jail since August, yet he was removed from power in April. And since then, that is to say in the last nine months, he claims he's won 28 out of 37 by-elections. Does that suggest to you that people believe he's been unfairly and wrongly treated 
And therefore, in addition to political popularity, maybe even in addition to whatever cricket popularity he still carries, he now also has the widespread sympathy of being a martyr. Well, you know, by-elections in this country don't really prove anything much. Um, I don't really think that that mattered. Uh, at, at, at that time, the PDM government that was running this country was extremely unpopular because of the IMF program. But just go back six, eight months. When Imran Khan was ousted via a legitimate vote of no confidence, he was very unpopular. The, if at that time elections had been held, every independent observer is of the opinion that Imran would have lost those elections. And the uh, PDM, People's Party and the, and the uh, Nawaz League uh, would have won a comfortable majority. Today, the tables have been turned. The performance of the PDM government, basically the Nawaz League in the lead and the People's Party solidly behind, though that government's economic decisions have alienated large sections of the population, especially the lower classes, uh, who were originally divided. Some were vote, likely to vote for religious parties, some were voting for Nawaz League, some for People's Party, some for Imran. But a lot of those classes have been very, very badly hurt by these economic policies. Now, and so therefore, their vote has now shifted away from here and there towards the PTI because they think that, well, PTI wasn't as bad when they were in power. Look at what these Johnnies have done. And so I think that's a terrible luggage that Nawaz League is carrying right now, and that has diminished its popularity. But as I said, if they had done, if they had gone to elections before they formed the government and ran it for 11 months and carried out all these terrible uh, economic policies, good for the country, bad for politics, uh, then things might have been different. But as things stand, as I said, they are on the ebb and, Nawa and Imran has, been, has risen back to a formidable uh, leader. But as you said at the very beginning, Elections are only likely to be held if the establishment feels they can get the outcome they want. And the outcome they want is clearly the Muslim League with Nawaz Sharif getting a fourth term as prime minister. The question is, will the Supreme Court allow Nawaz Sharif to stand? Because at the moment, I believe they're deciding this question of the length of his debarment. He wants it reduced from five years, sorry, from life to five years. Will the Supreme Court agree? I believe that verdict will be delivered any time in the next four or five days. Yes, I think it's an open and shut case. It's the views of the judges are clear. They have indicated as much that it's ridiculous on the basis of the fact that you're not a good Muslim. And who decides who's a good Muslim? <laughs> You've been disqualified for life. It's not, not tenable under any uh, rational, rational uh, legal decision. So my sense is they're going to overturn that. And as you know, he's been acquitted now on the two other cases, which were rigged against him. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And there was no evidence and they were rigged against him. So in a sense, Nawaz is now has a clean slate. It's Imran Khan whose slate is not clean. Regarding the 100 cases or so, I don't know. You know, in, in, in this country, uh, even journalists have at least a dozen cases on them at any given moment of time, whether it's sedition or whether it's breaking this law or breaking that law. And these things carry on and on and on. Uh, I think there are three or four serious cases against him. The rest is neither here nor there. And uh, uh, he's been convicted in one. And there's two or three are continuing. And he may get convicted in those two as well. Just to stick to Nawaz Sharif, you're saying to me, if I've understood correctly, that you believe that the Supreme Court judges have already indicated, although their judgment has not come out yet, that will only happen, we're told, in four or five or six days' time. But they've indicated through their statements that a debarment for life on grounds that you're deemed to be not a good Muslim is ridiculous. They will therefore accept the reduction of that debarment to five years. And if that happens, Nawaz will be free and cleared to contest. Have I understood correctly? I mean, they haven't said it's ridiculous. I'm saying it's ridiculous. <laughs> Their questions from the amicus curiae and the other lawyers have been aimed at trying to determine whether this is a good law or a bad law. And the very nature of those questions suggests that uh, they're thinking in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that uh, they will uh, bring the uh, disqualification down to five years. Now, you're a astute observer of the political situation. What's your hunch? I know it's still 30 days to voting and maybe a couple of more after that before the counting happens. 
But do you expect to see Nawaz Sharif as Prime Minister for a record fourth time? Once again, a billion dollar question. I think Nawaz wants to be Prime Minister for the fourth, fourth time, if only to redeem himself and to show the world that, you know, the states, uh, stage, the stage was rigged against him and he has a right to come back and complete a full term. Uh, he was never allowed to complete a full term three times that he was Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And all three times, the establishment determined to get rid of him. Uh, he hadn't done anything outstandingly wrong and they got rid of him. Uh, they wanted more, a more pliant uh, Prime Minister. Uh, so, I think Nawaz will want to be the Prime Minister. But whether Nawaz will want to be the Prime Minister of a weak coalition government, what if the new league, his league, doesn't get over 100 seats? What if they get or are given, whatever you like to call it, say about 70 or 80 seats? And he has to rely on a coalition of uh, untrustworthy partners uh, uh, who want concessions, constant concessions. He won't be able to run government. Will he then want, still want to be prime minister? Or would he then become like Sonia Gandhi, the somebody who sits outside the big leader and lets his brother and his daughter run the show? I think those questions are blowing in the wind. We will know more about these issues once we have the election results before us. My last question. In the circumstances that prevail today, and given the treatment of Imran Khan and his party and the way that's being perceived by the voters of Pakistan, will a Muslim League victory, or maybe I should put it a Nawaz Sharif victory, carry credibility in the eyes of the people of Pakistan? Or will this look like an outcome that's been fixed and rigged, and no matter who becomes prime minister, he will not have that essential popular backing that a Prime Minister who has to tackle the challenges Pakistan faces badly would need. Karan, except in 2013 and 2008, no Prime Minister, elected Prime Minister, has had that sort of credibility on the basis of, his, of the election results. That's the point I was trying to make. So really, it won't really matter much. But the fact is that if Nawashri becomes Prime Minister one way or the other, uh, the likelihood is that he will continue to be Prime Minister for a long time. Long time by that, I mean at least for the four or five years that are going to be part of his term. Unless he decides or he commits some very serious mistakes and starts stepping on the toes of the establishment all over again and is then discredited for one reason or another. We can't talk about those issues, but all other things being equal, as they say, uh, Nawaz Sharif will become Prime Minister or Shabazz Sharif will become Prime Minister uh, and the Noon League will be in the driving seat. Okay. In other words, at this moment, the road is clear for all possibilities, but you believe the most likely possibility is elections will be held and Nawaz Sharif will become Prime Minister, but that all hinges on the establishment having the confidence that this will be the outcome they get. In other yes. words, the final deciding person is General Munir and his sense of confidence in the outcome. Absolutely right. Najam Sethi, thank you very much for helping us understand the politics of your country. Take care. Stay safe. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.